Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica and I've had the pleasure of working alongside with Jennifer to create and present our topic of e-discovery and the role it plays in the legal field as well as how it applies to us as paralegals. Before we can get into the good stuff, we just wanted to outline the broad definition of what e-discovery is and all that it entails. The textbook definition will define it as the electronic aspect of identifying, collecting, and producing ESI, or otherwise known as electronically stored information, in response to a request for production in a lawsuit or investigation. Examples of ESI can come in a variety of forms, such as social media accounts, accounting databases, documents, emails, instant messages, and so forth. So exactly how did we get here? Let's consider the scenario before the evolution of computer and electronics in any type of office setting. As you can imagine, the frenzy of hard copy documents scattered everywhere. So now let's consider a general discovery process with hard copy documents. Each party will make the request for documents, which means sending out your request, receiving the hard copies, and don't forget the time consuming effort it takes to sort through these documents by hand and then organizing them accordingly. Fast forward to today, most documents are produced in electric format, specifically 95%. And with this new discovery process comes many advantages that overshadows the past. As always, we can find the advantages and disadvantages of almost anything and e-discovery is no different. So a few advantages that really capture the appeal of e-discovery are as follows. First, files provide the user with metadata, which is also understood as information about that data, whereas hard copy items lack metadata, so we can't search or sort through them as easily. For example, when we look at emails, we can see the last time it was opened and accessed, and that can really help our case. In addition, the most profound evidence is collected in the discovery process, but because e-discovery covers the scope of social media emails, instant messages, and documents, we have more data that we can collect. In most cases, any modification of ESI will be recognized, and if anything is deleted, it can be recovered. In addition, the increased volume of ESI requires limitations of discovery, and it forces us to only search through relevant data and use that relevant data. And one very important consideration is that there are sanctions in order for any party who withholds, delays, loses or deletes or destroys ESI. As for disadvantages, one main concern surrounds the issue of offices and their failed policies surrounding data retention, which influences expenses. And these expenses can be very damaging. This is later discussed in trends and projected trends. In addition, any improper carrying and preservation of ESI can be in question when personnel is not fully trained or educated on the e-discovery process, and with that inexperience, it can lead it to added time to discovery process, as well as added expenses. So exactly what does the e-discovery legal process look like? Well, it starts off with attorneys and working staff, such as paralegals, and they consider what information is relevant and they place that information on legal hold. Both sides get the opportunity to review what ESI is relevant then they can make requests or challenge the relevant information. And this is where the importance of sorting out irrelevant information is key because time and money is of the essence here. And then finally, whatever evidence is taken from that is then extracted, analyzed, and then converted into a PDF or TIFF form to use in court. At this point, you may be wondering how e-discovery and paralegals are linked together. Well, first off, Paralegals are the ones who would extract ESI and analyze it, of course, with consideration of the working attorney, and we could sort through what information is relevant to proceed. We also may be asked to explain the e-discovery process to our clients, information as how it is done and the critical consideration of costs. In addition, we may pursue further education and training and technology that aids the discovery process, for currently there is a lack of importance to training in e-discovery, because it's just now become so predominant. Naturally, we are required to ensure all e-discovery procedures are in compliance with federal law. And finally, we may work hand in hand with IT personnel to ensure that it is handled properly. 
With e-discovery on the rise, we looked into projected trends that surrounds ESI. First, cloud storage will simplify the way we collect data and how it's done, and documents stored in clouds will be able to be sent directly to vendors, clientele, or other legal aids in the office. In addition, electronic communication will then continue to become easier. In addition, corpus sizes will increase in discovery, but court timelines will remain the same, so discovery software will adapt. And finally, the process will continue to grow more user-friendly with furthering education and training. There are current and projected statistics that we found that show the growth and current understanding of e-discovery and ESI. First, 1.8 million is the average cost of companies during e-discovery. This is the importance of sorting out relevant information, and that's why it's so important to discuss with your plaintiffs what they're seeking and what they're willing to spend. 30 million account for the amount of money some Fortune 1000 companies pay for e-discovery annually. 18,000 average cost of reviewing one gigabyte of data. 38% of organizations have not employed new e-discovery technologies. This is why it is important to press the issue of continuing education and training. 57% of organizations spend more than $1 million on e-discovery per year. 96% of litigators believe that time and date are the most vital metadata in a case. 70% of e-discovery is paid to lawyers who review that data. 25% of companies anticipate that litigation against them will increase over the year. And the global market for e-discovery software and services is projected to rise to more than $11 billion by 2020. As electronically stored information became more relied upon for discovery, the federal rules needed to be changed to define ESI and regulate its use. Initially, the rules were updated in December of 2006 to add rules governing ESI, but as time went by, further amendments needed to be made and the rules were once again changed in 2015. Some of the biggest changes to the rules are broken apart here. FRCP 16 requires that parties enter into a scheduling order within 90 days of the defendant being served. This scheduling order determines the deadlines for parties to provide for disclosure, discovery, or preservation of ESI. FRCP 26 lays out rules for accessibility, such as FRCP 26 A1B, which makes it mandatory for parties to disclose the location of ESI even before they receive discovery requests. Rule 26's amendments also include limiting the scope of discovery and addressing any e-discovery which is burdensome or costly to produce. This rule also includes the clawback provision, wherein information must be returned which was accidentally produced. Rule 34A states that ESI includes writings, drawings, graphs, charts, photographs, sound recordings, images, and other data compilations stored in any medium from which information can be obtained or translated. It also requires for the producing party to allow the requesting party to copy, test, and sample ESI. Rule 34 also regulates the format in which ESI must be produced. The last big change to the rules is in FRCP 37, which discusses sanctions for lost ESI. The rules are based off whether the ESI was lost resulting from good faith operations of electronically stored information system or neglect. When a large number of electronic documents need to be organized for production, a party may consider hiring a third-party vendor. Third-party vendors are companies that coordinate the production of ESI. There are so many companies to choose from, it's important to have a clear understanding of your goals and to find a company with a reputation for handling those specific concerns. While third-party vendors can be expensive, the time saved by delegating to an expert may be well worth it. Here we've profiled some of the main questions to consider when hiring a third party. We chose the topic of e-discovery for this presentation because it is relatively new and paralegals who have a grasp on it are in high demand. As we see here, only 5% of law schools have e-discovery classes. So as you can imagine, the percentage of paralegal programs which do is even lower. Continuing education is always important to help stay on top of your game in this profession. 
Here are some ways that we new paralegals can add this skill to our arsenal and make ourselves more marketable. These training options range from seminars to online programs which you can take at your own pace. Thank you so much for checking out our presentation on eDiscovery. Jessica and I had our hands full of information on this topic and worked hard to choose information that we thought would be helpful for paralegal students looking for an understanding of the basics of this subject, as well as students looking to learn even more.